So welcome everyone and thank you so much for attending our May session of the Intersections and Interdisciplinary Human Trafficking Seminar Series. Um, as a reminder, we are recording, as you just heard me uh, click that button, and we'll send around a recording of the seminar after, um, after we're done today. So to get started, I want to pass it over to Sean Bamani to introduce our speakers today. Thanks, Casey, and thanks for everyone for joining. I'm really glad to see so much supply chain representation. It's glad to see it's good to see so many faculty here and students here. So thanks for being here. Um, my role is very small. I'm going to be um, just kicking us off, but very importantly, introducing two amazing students that we have at Demore McKim. Um, they've said that they'll be presenting in the order of Laura and Emma. So let me get started by introducing Laura first, and then um, Laura can go through her presentation, and then we'll switch over to Emma for the second half of today's Intersections presentation. Um, I find that these two students, uh, Emma and Laura, are setting two different sides of the same coin when it comes to problems in supply chain management. Emma coming at it from visualizing criminal networks such as human trafficking and how they work, and Laura coming at it from the corporate supply chain sustainability perspective. Um, as Laura is going first, I'm happy to introduce her first. Um, I met Laura in 2020 when she was a student in my Sustainable Supply Chains MBA course. Uh, as an upcoming graduate, she's focused on the intersection between supply chain management and corporate renewal. Uh, in my course, she immediately showed herself to be immensely passionate about sustainability practices to the extent that she went above and beyond in every project and case study that we conducted. Uh, based on her passion in 2021, at the beginning of this year, we embarked on an independent study during which Laura led a project that compares actual supply chain performance to common sustainability measures, which she'll be sharing with you now. I should note that on a personal level, you know, she conducted this research while taking classes for her MBA, while continuing her full-time day job at MIT as an associate director of class giving, including a 24-hour marathon event that she was intensively involved in this semester, and balancing all of the good she does is a feat in and of itself, in addition to the research that she accomplished this semester. When I think of Laura, I think of dedication and persistence. In my time knowing her, I can say that I'm sure she has the passion and the tools to influence companies to develop their approaches really to achieve positive, sustainable impact. It's my honor to call her my colleague and a like-minded friend of ours, and I'm very delighted to introduce her to you today. So with that, I'll pass it to Laura to take it away. Great, thank you, Professor Rimani. I'm gonna share my screen now. All right, so hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Laura and I am pleased to present my research on the slow evolution of the fashion industry with an upstream supply chain analysis. So I thought I'd begin with a brief overview of the global fashion industry supply chain. So it is one of the world's largest consumer industries generating $2.5 trillion annually. The industry is an important part of the global economy and has long served as an engine for economic development. So since about the 1980s, the globalization of garment manufacturing has driven the industrialization process for developing countries, and it has done so at a costly price. The fashion industry has a history of operating in an unsustainable manner that is focused on achieving profitable growth, often at the exploitation of people and the planet, specifically throughout its upstream supply chain processes. The good news is there are specific corporate models that can help the fashion industry move beyond some of the challenges that it faces in its upstream supply chain. So its practice of exploiting the planet and people for economic gains can be addressed through the implementation of a corporate sustainability model known as the triple bottom line. And this framework focuses on delivering long-term value by operating in an environmentally and socially responsible manner. This is done with good governance practices that support efforts while creating positive economic development. Also incentivized by consumer action in international legal frameworks, the global fashion industry is taking steps towards improving 
its business models and addressing some of the world's greatest challenges with a focus on corporate social responsibility. And finally, the world's largest sustainability initiative, the United Nations Global Compact, is also helping drive industry-wide change. So this compact is centered around 10 principles of corporate sustainability, and it aims to create business awareness and action in support of 17 sustainable development goals. Using this information as a foundation, the scope of this research focused on the fashion industry's role and contributions towards achieving two of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Goal 8 and 12, which they are focused on positive, decent work and responsible production, respectively. So this research aims to answer the three questions that we have outlined on the slide here. The first is how are global fashion brands supporting progress towards ensuring sustainable production patterns as well as positive employment and decent work for all? The second is how can the fashion industry move beyond minimal compliance and develop a proactive upstream supply chain strategy? And finally, the third is thinking about who needs to be involved and what needs to change in order for the fashion industry to accelerate its progress towards a sustainable upstream supply chain. In order to evaluate the global fashion industry's upstream supply chain, I looked at a set of 20 global fashion brands that are either leaders based on value or market share, recognized as sustainability front runners, or have unique sustainable supply chain characteristics. This set included both public and private brands, luxury and fast fashion brands, as well as standalone brands and those owned by multinational corporations and holding companies. So this slide outlines the 20 brands that were included in this research. The fashion industry's upstream supply chain is rather complex and varies based on the article of clothing that is being produced. So for the purpose of this research, the upstream supply chain was broken down into the tiers outlined on the slide. Tier zero is listed as a reference point, and this encompasses operations such as offices, retail, and distribution centers that are owned by the brand specifically. Tier one, those include suppliers that are closest to the brand, and this stage encompasses finished product final assembly. And the supply chain can be traced back to tier four, which includes initial raw material production and extraction. So you can see the farther we move away from the brand, the closer we get to that initial stage of raw material production. This research evaluated the fashion industry's upstream supply chain progress towards environmental and social sustainability with a focus on eight key issues, as well as four governance areas that have strong connections to sustainability. I've outlined these focus areas on the slide but for the purpose of this presentation and the time constraints we're working within, I'm only going to focus on the environmental issues as well as a few social issues. And I'll touch upon governance and how that is an important factor that supports both environmental and social sustainability. So the first environmental issue I want to discuss is greenhouse gas emissions and their impact on climate change. The fashion industry accounts for 10% of global carbon emissions. And at the current rate, this will increase to more than 50% within the next nine years. Of the brands assessed, 60% have established goals to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions with science-based targets initiative. And so these brands publicly communicate their goals and they report out annually on their climate impact in relation to greenhouse gas emissions. The greenhouse gas protocol is a standardized framework that many of these brands utilize, and it, it allows them to measure, manage, report, and reduce emissions across their supply chain by breaking it down into three different scopes. So I'll quickly touch upon those scopes. The first scope is direct emissions from sources owned or controlled by the company. So as I referenced tier zero, that's where we're looking at, is that specific tier of the supply chain. 
in scope one. And that's actually where the majority of the brands assessed are focusing their efforts. Scope three looks at emissions from the generation of purchased electricity consumed by the company. And finally, scope, excuse me, that was scope two. And scope three looks at all other indirect emissions from activities such as production of raw materials and outsourced manufacturing. Scope three is the hardest to measure and it accounts for the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. It represents upwards of 95% of a brand's total greenhouse gas emissions. Knowing this, only 45% of the brands assessed show evidence of working to reduce scope three emissions. The next environmental area of focus is raw materials. So from soil degradation to the destruction of protected rainforests, to the use of millions of barrels of oil to produce synthetic materials, the fashion industry's sourcing of raw materials is directly linked to biodiversity loss. Overall, 90% of the brands assessed are focusing on increasing their use of environmentally friendly materials, such as using sustainable cotton, recycled polyester, and lyocell, a man-made cellulose fiber. Yet only 10% of those companies assess publicly share that they use a raw materials matrix to classify which materials have higher environmental impact. So by understanding the full environmental impact of the raw materials utilized throughout fashion production, these brands can make better sourcing choices and begin to move towards regenerating resources. While all of the brands assessed rely on land intensive inputs, such as cotton, only half are taking action to increase regenerative farming practices, which increases biodiversity while mitigating climate change. The next two areas we'll take a, a look at are water stress and chemical management. And these were identified as two key environmental issues within the fashion industry's upstream supply chain. So textile production, including farming, utilizes nearly 93 billion cubic meters of water annually. And it is estimated that 20% of industrial water pollution is attributed to the dyeing and treatment of textiles. So of those brands that were assessed, most are aware of the issues surrounding water stress and have started to develop mechanisms to understand the impact of their water use. However, only 30% fully understand their water footprint across all of their supply chain tiers. So from tier one all the way to tier four. And very few have a comprehensive program in place to mitigate their water consumption and contamination. In regards to chemical management across the upstream tiers of the fashion industry's supply chain, it should assess inputs, processes, and outputs. So this research indicated an inconsistent approach to chemical management across the brands assessed and identified that only 65% utilize industry-wide guidelines and tools available. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and focus on some of the social issues within the upstream tiers of the fashion industry's supply chain. The first social issue I want to highlight is compensation and working hours. So it is estimated that only 2% of people involved in the production of clothing earn a living wage. A livable wage is defined as sufficient to meet the basic needs of a worker and their family while providing some discretionary income. So this includes food, rent, healthcare, education, clothing, transportation, as well as savings. So developing countries are eager to make their economies attractive to business. They tend to keep their wages low and the wages that are set at the minimum level are below the livable wage. So this creates a cycle of poverty for those workers within the fashion industry's upstream supply chain. The poverty wage issue is prevalent across all tiers and workers are paid based off of the minimum wage set by the government or the industry average. And so the industry average may not even be higher because 
we have a number of brands that are sourcing from the same company, the same uh, suppliers globally in the same countries that have low wages set. None of the brands included in this study showed evidence of paying upstream supply chain workers a livable wage, and only 35% of those assessed actually acknowledge the need to pay workers a livable wage. So failure to do so has the potential to lead to another issue, which is excessive work hours. So 15 brands included in the study outlined policies regarding work hours in their supplier codes of conduct, yet only 30% yet 30 actually indicated that excessive work hours are an issue and have been over the last two years. So although they're outlining policies to mitigate excess work hours, it's still an issue that needs to be addressed in a different way. The second social issue I will address is building in fire safety. In 2012, the Tazreen Fashion Factory fire took the lives of 112 workers. Five months later, in April of 2013, the collapse of the Rana Plaza factory killed 1,132 workers. These two events both occurred in Bangladesh just over a century after the 1911 New York Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. So while the production has changed from the United States to Bangladesh, subpar building and fire standards for factories continues to be a primary concern for the fashion industry. 65% of the brands included in this study outline minimum building and fire safety requirements in their supplier codes of conduct. And this is often listed under the overarching category of health and safety. So of those that publicly disclose information on building and fire safety, the majority place ownership on their suppliers to actually implement safety protocols. And only 20% of the brands have developed a program to collaborate with their suppliers to ensure adequate building and fire safety practices are implemented. So here we can see a gap in the responsibility for what takes place across the different tiers of the supply chain. So to tie all of this together, there are risks, both social and environmental, that occur across all tiers of the fashion industry's upstream supply chain. However, the risk escalates the farther you move down the supply chain from tier zero to tier four. And this can be attributed to the fact that the brand's level of control and the availability of information decreases the farther you move away from operations owned by the brand. This research used a four point scale from zero to three to assess the action taken to address the eight environmental, social, environmental and social issues, as well as the implementation of four different governance practices, producing a maximum score of 36. The data on the slide shows the top five ranked brands of those assessed. And you can see that there is a correlation between the brand's research sustainability score that was assigned and the visibility into their supply chain. So you can see here, Patagonia, CNA, Levi Strauss, Eileen Fisher, and Stella McCartney, they ranked um, the highest out of all of the brands, and they all have visibility beyond tier one of their supply chain. So they are working to look at their supply chains from tier two, three, and four. This visibility through the traceability of both raw materials and labor will allow global fashion brands to better understand their impact and communicate information about their business practices and products to external stakeholders. So visibility is enabled through traceability, which allows companies to be transparent. So where do we go from here? So fashion brands, they have a lot of work that they can do. And the first step towards driving sustainable change is to understand the impact and influence across all tiers of the supply chain. 
They need to focus on developing an accurate understanding of um, their fashion brands by mapping out their upstream supply chain from farm to factory. So a sustainable global fashion industry requires collaboration across all tiers, and that collaboration will allow the accurate mapping of the supply chain. In addition, a development of a shared vision with the suppliers will allow them to take ownership over their sustainability strategy and performance. So a focus on continuous improvement will require the support of the brand to enable capacity building for the suppliers to take on that ownership. Another key area where the fashion industry can focus is industry-wide collective impact, is that global fashion brands, they have the opportunity to shift their mindset from, from competing to collaborating with one another. And by doing so, they would benefit from the development of consistent standards, supplier assessments, monitoring processes. And so all of this will help achieve that sustainable vision in a simpler manner. Progress can also be accelerated by sharing best practices, tools, and data across the companies. Because many of the fashion brands, they utilize suppliers that serve multiple brands. So a collaboration across those brands will help them to work better with their suppliers. And finally, it's important for sustainability to be integrated across all business functions. By integrating it within strategy, operations, and culture, global fashion brands, they can move from being reactive where they are now to proactive and begin to realize the benefits of a sustainable business model. The industry's efforts to shift to a more sustainable model cannot exist in isolation. Systemic change requires the collaboration of all relevant stakeholders from the business sector, government, and civil society. Global fashion brands can engage in policy support for regulations that incentivize sustainable action. They can utilize growing consumer uh, demands for sustainability, and they have the opportunity to organize and create transparent, just supply chains. So I'd like to end by asking you to consider the following questions. Who made my clothes and what's in my clothes? Thank you.